former President Trump sat down with his buddy Sean Hannity for a town hall and, you know, mostly softballs, as you would expect. But they did have a bit of a tense exchange around mail-in voting, mail-in ballots. Let's take a listen to a little bit of that. Will you encourage your voters, based on the system we have, to ha go along with the system of early voting and voting by mail? Because I, I, I think if you don't, you it's a big mistake. No, no, no. I will, but those ballots get lost also, Sean. You know, they send them in and all of a sudden they're gone. Those ballots get lost also. The answer is I will because you would like it. But you okay. know what? Can You're I be honest? For me. Okay. But a lot of, I got to take a break. But Sean, a lot of bad things happen to those ballots also. They're sent in early and all of a sudden, where are they? That was the fourth I mean, time that they sparred on that, Crystal. He's not going to let it go. He is so... Donald Trump is the most stubborn man on the face of this earth. I love how he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. But no, really, I won't do it because yeah. those ballots get stolen. And I guess you would like it, Sean, so maybe I'll do it. But no, those ballots are really bad. I mean... The reason I say he's so stubborn is the data is pretty clear. If he had just pushed for mail-in balloting during the pandemic and like encouraged his supporters that that was like the patriotic way to vote, he probably would be president of the United States. So personally, I'm glad that he is a fool and continues down this pathway and that there's this huge partisan divide that has opened up in terms of how people cast their ballots, which it actually used to be the exact opposite. It used to be Republicans who are more likely to vote early, vote, you know, by mail because they're tended to be older and that's was, you know, more common way for older people to vote. Now it's completely flipped. There's this huge partisan divide and they're just shooting themselves in the foot by not pursuing this. Yeah, this is uh, certainly something. And also you have seen other Republicans, even many who are skeptical of them. I've even seen my biggest interest is like former Stop the Steelers who are now mm. getting involved in this because yeah. their narrative is, uh, and I mean, it's wrong, but this is, their, this is their idea, is we've lost because the left is so good at ballot harvesting. This is like almost like a Dinesh D'Souza type analysis of the election. They're like, because we're so bad at ballot harvesting. Ballot harvesting then though, is not going to is not illegal. We can't outlaw it. There's nothing, or it is illegal. But you know, in terms of what they say, the real ballot harvesting initiatives, you you can't actually go against it. So we have to build the most robust ballot harvesting operation and actually win the election. A guy like uh, Scott Pressfield comes to mind. I've seen him talk about this. He's a quote, the persistence on Twitter, if you're not mm. familiar who I'm talking about. I've seen a number of uh, MAGA stop the steal figures actually use this line of argumentation. But there's only one who the boomers actually listen to. His name is Trump. And a yeah. lot of these people, they all came to the polls to vote in person on election day, specifically because they were told by Trump that they shouldn't vote by mail and that vote by mail is bad. And as we have you know, showed the data ad nauseum here, you know, Trump and Georgia in particular, if just the number of people who vote in the uh, Republican primary of 2020 by mail did so in the election, he wins the election. There, there's no question. Uh, Arizona as well, I fully believe he would have won the state of Arizona free and clear if he just embraced mm. mail-in voting because of so many of the uh, older voters. And then the, the, the other ones, I mean, it's one of those where the election was close enough of who the hell knows what actually would have happened. So he's doing nobody but himself. Uh, you know, it, like he's hurting nobody but himself. But yeah. he doesn't care. That's what he believes. And for those who think they can nudge Trump in that direction, as Hannity, his you know most kiss-ass ally, thinks he can, <laughs> he's not going to listen. Yeah, and just so people understand a little bit of why this matters, you know, why it's such an advantage to really be pushing your supporters to vote early, it's because listen, a lot of things can happen on election day. You know, your life can go sideways at any moment. The kids need this, the, you know, dog gets sick. Like anything can happen on a single individual day. And so you want to, if you're a political campaign, bank as many votes as you can, as early as you can. So you've got them checked off. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to continue sending them mailers. You don't have to continue calling them. You don't have to continue showing up their door. They're done. And then you can move on to this other universe of voters of like people who need more encouragement, who, you know, help them make their voting plan, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a tremendous advantage if you have a large percentage of your base showing up early. And uh, so, you know, and, and I do think even if Trump now enthusiastically embraced mail-in voting, 
I do think they did so much damage to the idea and the credibility of doing that during the pandemic and during the 2020 campaign that I still think there would be a bit of a hangover effect of people who just have it in their minds now, like this is not a way to vote. Your votes are not going to be counted if you vote this way. Um, but it would help a lot if the big guy was on board with the change of program. So I definitely think he is massively shooting himself in the foot here by, you know, being continuing to be clearly ambivalent about going in this direction. At the same time, you know, kind of an interesting poll coming out of New Hampshire. Let's put this up on the screen. I want to hear what you make of this saga. Mm -hmm. So we've got Trump at the top. Trump is down, though, five points in this poll from April. He's at 37 percent. Ron DeSantis basically hanging steady at 23 percent. Um, Then you have everybody else coming up a bit. You got Tim Scott jumping up six points. He's at eight percentage points. Um, The media is very invested in like a Tim Scott bump narrative right at the moment. You got Chris Christie coming in six percent. He's up five points from the last poll. This one, I don't even, I have no analysis of this. I have no idea where this came from. Doug Burgum notching six percent. North Dakota governor that literally no one ever heard of (laughs) and probably still hasn't heard of. I guess people just like the name 6%. Uh, another one that uh, we should we should talk more about either today or another time, but Vivek Ramaswamy I'm seeing consistently coming up in every poll. I just saw a national poll that had him coming up quite significantly as well, but he's at 5% here, Nikki Haley 5%. Mike Pence, the other big loser in this poll, sinking all the way down to 1%. And maybe start with that, Zagar. I mean, this is the former vice president of the United States. This is a man who has been a huge figure in conservative politics for quite a long time, has really worked hard to galvanize that evangelical base. You're at 1%? Chris Christie's been, Doug Burgum and Vivek Ramaswamy are beating you? I mean, how does that happen? It's humiliating. Uh, especially the, the, the Pence fall from grace here and the kind of catch up to reality has been, you know, one of the more satisfying elements of the campaign, I think, so far. Doug Burgum, I mean, he's spending a hell of a lot of money right now, you know, in terms of ads. So I actually think that probably can account for it. Remember, uh, Tom Steyer at several points was polling between five and like six percent simply because he was spending like hundred million dollars or so on advertising. So if you spend your way, you can usually get up to a decent amount. Now, I do think that the most noteworthy thing was the drop in that poll by five points of Donald Trump. But at the same time, he said 37 percent. He's maintaining such a significant lead. For DeSantis, he did pick up some, but he's not picking up all. And it does show also that all of these other candidates whose name are not DeSantis are directly a problem for him. They are drawing away from the anti-Trump support. He usually is going to be their number two choice. And so it does show that DeSantis really has a problem in terms of trying to get to even sort of a plurality because Trump does have so much support throughout the GOP base, and especially in New Hampshire. I mean, New Hampshire, oh, we should never forget, is the state that gave him his very first you know, primary victory of 2020, and it was a blowout, actually, at the time. That really is what put him on the map and on the road to true victory whenever it came to the 2016 primary. So I do think uh, that New Hampshire will be the big bellwether in the state. It's also why I think that guys like Burgum, Chris Christie, and others who don't have the same evangelical support base of Iowa are going to go all in on that state as well. Well, New Hampshire is interesting and is always kind of a wild card because um, independents can vote in the Republican primary, so you can pick which primary you want to vote in. And so it's not as much of just a hardcore, dedicated Republican base, whereas Iowa is the polar opposite. When you're talking about a caucus state, these are going to be your most diehard supporters because you don't just show up and cast the ballot or send in your ballot by a minute. You got to be there. You got to do a whole thing. Like it's a whole process, right? So you got to be committed to it if you're going to go and cast your ballot in Iowa. So New Hampshire gives more of an opening um, for, I think, a a wider variety of candidates. That's why this is the state, certainly Chris Christie feels he's going to do the best in because you have not just the hardcore Republican base, but you have independents who may be more inclined to hear his message, his very aggressively anti-Trump message and take that seriously. Um, Listen, if I was any of the candidates not named Donald Trump, I would like this poll because this is what they were hoping for, that Trump would be, you know, in the 30s, 37 percent. And then you can imagine a scenario where it's like, all right, if I end up as the primary Trump alternative and everyone sort of coalesces around me, 
then it got a shot at this thing. A lot of the other polls we've been seeing, Trump is over 50%, and then it's, you know, it's really hard to see the pathway. So the problem for Ron DeSantis, obviously, is that he's also flat in this poll, that all these other contenders are taking peace out of his pie, not just down of Donald Trump's pie. But, you know, I, again, I think that this is one of the more hopeful polls that the Trump alternatives have probably seen because it, it kind of is a 2016 throwback. They could tell themselves like, oh, maybe this is kind of his ceiling here. And if we can just coalesce behind one alternative, we'll be able to get the job done. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what it looks like in New Hampshire. Uh, a little more interesting than some of the other state polls or national polls that we've been seeing. And, uh, the most shocking to me is the Doug Burgum at 6%. Did not see that one coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And by the way, really want to interview him. So we put yes, our request Doug. in. Please Governor come on the Burgum, show. We will be, we will be fair. You know, we ask policy questions, as anyone will tell you, but we will be fair. We want to hear your plan for the nation. We want to hear what people in New Hampshire are seeing in you. So please, please come on the show so we can give you, so we can talk to you. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.